Oh, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of First Canada Live. Tonight is going to be a big one. It is every bot reveal night. I'm your host, Karthik Canada's of Apathy, and I'm super pumped for this show. It's going to be a big one, maybe our best one ever. Who knows? It's going to be a lot of fun. But before we get started, as Canadians, it is important to recognize the land of which we are a part. As we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect upon the meaning of place and in doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we celebrate today. We acknowledge the elders and youth, past, present, and emerging of all the land on which we work and live. We honor the ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the indigenous nations who've cared for Turtle Island, also called North America. The indigenous people have been gifted the role of caretakers of this land before the arrival of settler peoples until today. But most importantly, we must remember the history of these lands and people that have been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who called Canada home before it was given this name. This audio is something that, it, this history is something that is affected by, that everyone is affected by. We are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect upon and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, it does not define our future. All right, folks, thank you. This is going to be a good one, so let's not waste any time. First off, I want to introduce my co-host for tonight's show, a member of the First Canada Youth Council and a member of Team FRC Team 5024, Rate of Robotics from London, Ontario. Say hello to Aaron S. What's up, Aaron? Hey, I'm super excited to be here. I'm so glad to be on the show today. It's going to be a good one, Aaron. Are you like, how, like on a scale of one to 10, how pumped are you for the Everbot? I'm really pumped. I'm I'm glad that it's going to be a bit of a surprise for me because I haven't we haven't showed you the yet. video yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you was, haven't shown that, it to me. That was by design. We wanted like some like live instantaneous uh, reaction. Uh, you know, normally right now it's like when we say like a brief outline of what's happening today. But guess what? Everybody's happening. Everybody's what's happening. But we got two groups here today because we got. Our friends from Team 118, the Everybot, they will be talking about the Everybot. We've also got uh, Dan Kimura from First in Michigan here today, who's going to be talking about some of the resources that uh, First in Michigan has developed around the Everybot. So it's like a, it's it's a complete thing. We got like a rock star crew of oh, yeah. uh, firsters here. So this is going to be really good. So that's what's happening today. Uh, if you're joining in, in chat for the first time, hey, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, feel free to post any questions you want in the chat. We will do our best to answer them live on air, or maybe one of our panelists will answer them in the chat. So it's going to be a good one. And also remember here, why are we here, folks? We're here to have fun and celebrate excellence in our community. So let's uh, keep the chat positive and let's keep everything moving. But uh, before we get started with the main parts of the show, uh, as is the tradition on the show, we always rely on our youth council to keep us well. And while this is so important, especially during the build season, it's important for everyone to be taking care of themselves, uh, both physically and mentally. So Aaron, what do you have for today's wellness moment? So um, especially right now um, with build season and exams coming up for a lot of us, um, it's really important for, for us to take those moments for ourselves and just kind of wind down. For me personally, I love to just throw on my headphones, especially a really good pair with really nice audio, yeah. um, and just listen to some music or um, some headspace meditations are really good for just taking a moment to wind down. Um, it's just a really nice way to let go of whatever's going on in your life, even if it's just for a few moments. Hey, that is some really good advice, but I got questions for you. So first yeah. of all, what kind of headphones are you using? These are not the good ones. What, what, are, your good, what are your good ones? What are your good ones? My good ones, um, I just got them. They're Skull Candy. I don't know the exact nice. um, model, but yeah, yeah I, I got I, I got the Beats Pros. It's like they they treat me well. It's like it's just like, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's nice. It's uh it's really good. And what's your song of choice or band of choice right now? Oh, I I jump around everywhere. Um, I couldn't I couldn't pick any <laughs> anything to be honest with you. I just listen to whatever I'm feeling in the moment. Yeah, like this is, I'm just going to sound old right now, but I got this like old 80s song stuck in my head today, Leave a Light On For Me by Belinda Carlisle. And it is like the most 80s song you could think of. Like when you listen to this song, it just feels like I should be watching like, you know, the never ending story or something. But it's just very, it's just like, it's been in my head, but it's a good one. Yeah, um, I, I, I love music as an escape. Uh, I think it's just so... You know, sometimes you can do your best thinking with music and like, I don't know, it's just like, it's like art being injected into your ears or something like that. You know, yeah. like, you know, we got a comment in chat saying, wasn't expecting never ending story references. Hey, <laughs> if you are, if you're here for like 
obscure 80s and 90s movie references like i am your 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 guy i am the person for that you want other robot stuff and strategy like maybe but like yeah we want to talk about you know like all the john hughes classics you know we're here for that so it's going to be good all right aaron thank you for that wellness moment uh let's just jump into some quick news updates uh first candle live show schedule so we've gone back to back the last two weeks but for the rest of the build season we're going to be going back to every other week with shows but then when competition season starts here in Ontario, we'll be doing weekly recap shows of the events in Ontario. We'll be bringing on game announcers and MCs, do a strategic deep drive into some of the big matches of the week. And it's going to be a, a really fun. So, you know, because we know lots of the times if you're at an Ontario event on a weekend, you're missing the other Ontario event that's happening on the other part of the province. So you want to catch up to see what happens, see what all your friends teams have been doing. So tune into First Candle Live for all of that. And uh, as a reminder, uh, in-person events are back here in Ontario. We're full capacity. Uh, anyone can come. It's back to the old jam. Only thing is, is a reminder that masks are still mandatory so we can keep everyone safe and, uh, you know, make sure that folks aren't getting sick throughout the season. And of course, vaccination, especially getting that bivalent booster, strongly recommended. Also for our Ontario teams, if you want to connect uh, and, you know, the best resource for any FRC team is other FRC teams because teams are just so good at helping each other. And that's why we have the official FRC Ontario Slack. It's a great place to post questions, you know, having trouble getting your limelight hooked up or having trouble imaging your Robo Rio or you're trying to figure out, do I really need to pick up clones off the floor? Ask your questions in the Slack. There'll be lots of people to help. Aaron, are you in the Ontario team Slack? I am not, but I'll, I'll be joining after You've got to click that link, buddy. You've got to <laughs> click that link that's going into chat right now to join up. Also, Absolutely. Aaron, are you in grade 12 this year? I am in grade 12 this year. Okay, this announcement right now is for you, buddy. January okay. 31st is the deadline for the Don Bosi Leadership and Innovation Scholarship and the Canadian Women in STEM Scholarships. So these are some really big scholarships. Uh, we've had lots of uh, illustrious people win these in the past, like Malat Mahak Deliwal and Namira Kadir, just these amazing rock stars. So if you want to apply, like, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that happens is you've written a pretty cool essay and that you could probably use for something else. So apply, apply, apply. Uh, link is going into chat, uh, www.firstroboticscanada.org slash scholarships. And for all the First Canada alumni out there, we've got a pretty cool LinkedIn group. Uh, so you should join that, you know, just stay connected. Uh, you know, it's great. There's, there's like old people like me in there and there's young people. So you can connect for uh, job opportunities, advice on startups, any of those sorts of things. So jump in right there and it'll be good. All right, Aaron, I don't think we should waste any more time. I think we're, we're ready. So we're going to be back with the Everybot crew after word from one of our sponsors, Hatch. When I was applying for co-ops, I was really looking for a place that would allow me to have the greatest amount of experience. And since Hatch is such a big company, I knew that I would be able to get involved with all the different groups that the company offers. What surprised me about working at Hatch um, was the amount of responsibility that you're given very quickly, like once you start. There's so many opportunities to learn, not just from specialists in the field, but also from something like lunch and learns, or even safety shares. So it's not something technical that I'm learning, but something that might help me in my everyday life. For me to be able to just walk into their office and ask them whatever I want, to schedule a meeting whenever I want, to be able to work directly with them on building things was, was, was an insanely good experience. As a student, I am as much valued as the other employees that are here. I enjoy working here because people are very friendly and this environment that they created has been more than absolute perfect. All right, let's do this. Let's bring out the rock stars. Introducing first, she is a first alum of Team 3184 Blaze Robotics from Burnsville, Minnesota, current mentor of Team 118, an alumni of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and a planning and integration specialist for the Office of Planning, Integration, and Environmental at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Longtime veteran on First Canada Live, we got Jenna Kay. How's it going, Jenna? I am so hyped to be here. I know I was just here a week ago, but it feels like home, honestly. Yeah, like you, you're like part of the crew right now. You're basically an honorary Canadian, even though last week you didn't admit that Canada existed, but we just got to get you up here, right? That's what's going to prove it for you. 
I agree. You got to get me up there. Otherwise, you know, the evidence, is it there? I don't yeah, know. We got to bring you up for one of our events. It'd be pretty cool to have you up as the judge or something like that. I love uh, that. Next up, we've got a first alum and the drive coach for Team 118, the Robonauts from League City, Texas, currently studying mechanical engineering at the University of Houston and working as a mechanical engineering co-op at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Ethan Reed is here. How's it going, Ethan? It's going great. I cannot wait to share this robot with you all. Oh, we can't wait to see it. Hey, so like last year when we chatted with you, it was like you're, you were going into your first year of being 118's drive coach. And like, I know we're talking here to talk about every bot, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask, how was that experience for you? It was incredible. Um, I got to play with some of the greats. Uh, I got to learn a lot of lessons, won a couple of tournaments, didn't win as many as I wanted, but I'm back and uh, excited to uh, do it again this year. Well, it's going to be a good season. It's going to be a good season. You know why it's going to be a good season for so many teams? Because like 200 or 300 teams around the world are going to be using the every bot. And that's why it's going to be a good so. season for them. That's, so. Well, we we got to show them. we got to show them. And finally, we've got a first alum and current mentor of Team 118, currently studying mechanical engineering at the University of Houston and working as a robotics mechanical designer for lunar exploration rovers at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Ryan Stockton is here. How's it going, Ryan? Doing great. Excited to show the world every bot. That's right. And so like Ryan and Ethan, when you two were in high school, you, you came up to Canada to compete at the Greater Toronto Regional East in 2016, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that was uh, that was a great experience. Uh, we came up to try to end the streak. Uh, and We didn't do that, but uh, we, you we continued the streak. With, uh, you propagated <laughs> the, streak. the streak. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Were, were we the last one? Maybe were we, were you we were, the last you one were, in the streak? You were the last win in 2056 a streak. 118 and 2056 yeah. beat 1114 and 1241 in the final. I think it went to three matches, right? It sure did. It, it was some sure close did. matches. And then it was like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And there was like one ball and 11-14 ignored it and then went up to hang and then lost. Yeah, yeah. Remember that one. Yeah, good times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it was fabulous. It was such a fun event. I remember um, having you all up there. It was uh, pretty, pretty cool. And then, you know, last year I got to see the Houston Hospitality going down the Champs for the first time in Houston, which was a pretty amazing event. Uh, so before we get started here, uh, you know, we should obviously talk a little bit about the game charged up. And so, you know, we heard from Jenna last week, but um, I haven't heard from Aaron at all on this. So Aaron, what do you think of the charged up game? I am really excited about this year's game. I think it's um, a lot different than what I've personally seen in my time with first, just because um, my first game was infinite recharge. Um, so the fact that there's no it, the cargo in the game, there's no balls in this one, um, is just a different thing to tackle altogether. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting for um, especially the people on my team that it's, have been on since the same time as me, um, just seeing how we're going to navigate um, figuring out how to even maneuver these, these cargo pieces on the field. Right. And so uh, maybe I'll go to Ethan first. Uh, Ethan, what were your first reactions about this game? Well, you know, I've I've never really played a full pick and place game. Um, I've been gone for the That's two wild. most recent pick and place games. Uh, I played 2017. I think it's going to be this year is going to be a really similar game to 2017. Um, but of course, when I was a driver in that game, we didn't play it as a pick and place. We were a shooter, so we we didn't get the full experience. So I'm excited for uh, full field cycles, robots smashing into each other, and maybe a little bit more strategic depth than just shooting balls. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about is like, people are like, you know, compare this game to past games. And I was like, it has been a, like, when I say a long time since teams have had to reach out, because like some people are like, oh, 2011, like that's like a pick and place arm game. It was sort of like some people used arms, but like you could do that game with an elevator and a clock. And so it wasn't super reach. And then like, you've got to go way back to like 2007, 2005 era for a long reaching pick and place game and i think that's gonna that's gonna show this year let me just say that yeah, that's gonna it was, show. It seems almost halfway cruel that there's uh, so much incentive to have a small drive base in in the year where you also <laughs> have to reach out greater than the length of your robot so yeah the, the uh, trade-off tippy robot this year <laughs> I, you know i said this last week uh when jenna was on my my, my thing that i know what's going to happen is there's going to be a team that's trying to score and it's trying to score they're going to fall on the grid and like block all nine spots like it's just going to be a thing and then someone's going to try and like write them and they're going to like beach themselves and it's just going to be a giant mess ryan what did your what were your thoughts on the game Oh, I was excited to see an end game that isn't climbing. You know, we've had climbing for quite a while now. It almost felt like every game was going to have an end game of climbing, but the bridge balancing kind of similar to 2012. Um, Robonauts are no stranger to unique mechanisms for balancing bridges, but, uh, you know, I was excited to see something different. 
I would argue that y'all are strangers because you weren't allowed to use the mechanism ever. So, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> throwing that one out there. I'm glad that history uh, lives within the team. You know, I always love it when I talk to uh, team members and team alumni who always talk about robots that were that were that predate them. It's just kind of cool that teams uh, have that sense of history. So I think it's enough chit chat because I think we could talk about some of the design decisions and some of the challenges or whatever. But like, I think let's let's take a look at the video first, uh, just because I think that's going to set the stage, and then we can go from there. So. Everyone watching worldwide, you know, let's let's do this. Let's get ready to our rumble. It's time to take a look at the 2023 Everybot. And folks, we have muted the audio to make sure we don't run into foul of Twitch's copyright issues. So. All right, folks. All right. I'm sure the audience is like kind of captivated by this. If you have questions, drop them into chat. Our producers will move them into a doc. We'll try and answer as many of them as we can. Okay. There's a lot there, but I want to, Aaron, you had not seen that video yet. Your thoughts. I love, for, like, first and foremost, I love the versatility of the intake and um, how you're able to pick up both game pieces. Cause I know a lot of my team's discussion was about how might we like, how are we going to decide which um, which piece we're going to go for and like trying to figure out which which one we can really pick up or which is more beneficial and the fact that you guys can not only pick up both game pieces but score them in multiple different like on different levels is really incredible to me and it, that gets me really excited for for seeing this year's competitions and seeing how they play out uh by the way, if you're not watching the chat, chat loves it. So that's a, uh, that's a good start. <laughs> I have, I have many questions. I have many questions and it's like, I almost uh, don't know where to start uh, right now, but I guess we'll start at the beginning and the beginning of any robot is strategic design. So, uh, you know, Jenna, last week you shared the priorities of what was going on here, but when you come to strategic design, um, you know, you run into trade-offs. So I'd love to talk about the various trade-offs that you had to go through. And so the first one is this robot does not pick anything up off the floor. And I'd love to hear about the decision-making process for that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, I know, I know last week I mentioned, and I, I don't know if it was a controversial opinion because I remember the other people on the, on the call being like, yeah, floor is going to be super important. And I remember in my head being like, huh, everybody's not going to do floor. <laughs> like, I hope that's not a problem. But, you know, after doing a lot of the analysis and figuring out that we could do high as well, um, it just made the most sense. And I think Ethan is a great person to explain the strategic design if you want to take it from there. Yeah, so so we started uh, unsure of exactly what we were going to do. We had another entire robot concept that we prototyped really far down the path of, uh, but decided that uh, at, at the highest level, so we're, we're trying to build a robot that can play at any level, be an amicable alliance partner at any level of play. Um, at the highest level, we found that, you know, we don't think the, the whole scoring grid is going to be filled up. We think that the top row is going to be full, uh, the middle row will maybe get pretty close to full, but that... Uh, you probably shouldn't be trying to waste your cycle scoring them into the hybrid nodes and that you want to score them high. Um, another design constraint that we tend to work under for every bot is we want to have a two position arm that we can stall the motor against a hard stop on either side. Um, and when we came up with this, uh, when, well, when Ender, the designer of the arm, drew this, uh, this linkage that could swing out and swing back in, 
um, and present an intake perfectly at the right angle at all, all of the positions we needed. Um, it just kind of jumped out at us and we had this aha moment of, yeah, we need to, we need to build that one. Um, another big piece of being an amicable alliance partner in this game is uh, utilizing the portals effectively. Uh, there's the single substation and the double substation. The single substation, the one on the side, is really hard to line up to because uh, the depth perception from the driver station is, is much harder to do than just lining up left, right in the double substation. Um, and in addition, of course, we, we, don't, we don't have the floor intake. We thought we may have wanted it at one point, but there are only eight game pieces that start on the floor. Um, at the highest level, we're, we're pretty sure that uh, there are going to be robots picking up most, if not all, of those off of the floor. So maybe your third robot at Champs, for instance, uh, probably does not need to have a floor intake. Um, if you're picking a third robot at Champs to play offense, um, all the game pieces are probably, or most of them anyway, are gone in Auton. So you need to be fast at that human player down uh, to your end of the field cycle. Uh, and this robot does that. We've, we've got the, the shelf intake that hits it with a roller as wide as we could possibly get it, um, and then run back down and reach out as far as we could to get to the top post. Hey. Uh uh, Ethan and Ryan and Jenna, um, how fast can you run into the station and still get the game piece? Did you mess around with that? Yeah, it's fast. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so the four bar, the four, the four bar linkage in the arm, uh, the top member of that that's normally under only tension, um, is polycarbonate. So when we run into the wall, uh, there's a shot in the video. The arm folds up and nothing breaks. Uh, we're able to hit it pretty darn fast, and the game piece still sucks right up because. Those two rollers are in the right place that they hit the cone. They tilt it up 45 degrees to so get a little bit extra reach. And you've already got the game piece. So once you hit the wall and you go in any further, it um, doesn't really matter. It doesn't break it. Just reverse and come back out. I love that you can kind of go full speed into it. It's not that you have to slow down. That's a that's a real big advantage. Uh, you know, what I uh, our producer had a good idea. Um, Jalen, do you want to bring the video up again? And we can just play it again. And then we can just chat while it's going because there's no sound. You know, like, I mean, there's sound in the real version. There's the so Twitch just doesn't let us let us do these sorts of things. Um, so scoring high, uh, you all released a every bot will list that did not include scoring high, uh, but it ended up scoring high. How did that happen? Did the robot just like reach out and make it happen? Like what happened here? Ryan, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. So we originally like had a prototype that was an arm that picked up off the floor with a similar intake to this, very similar geometry, and would actually go all the way up around the top of the robot and would score on the mid um, post. What that required was, was precise um, position control of the arm and like Ethan mentioned earlier, we really try to design an everybot arm to not need any sort of position control software. You can just stall the motor against the hard stop. It won't rip itself apart. And basically just want to be in two positions. Last year, we had the over center linkage. Um, this year, we, we, were, we were really going towards that robot that required, that required um, position, position control on the arm. And we just we felt that it would be a struggle for teams. And so we, we worked pretty hard through the night. I think it was Wednesday night and tried to do figure out whatever sort of geometries we could figure out that would prevent us from having to do that. And like Ethan mentioned, uh, the linkage that Ender drew, this magic linkage um, on this robot, ended up scoring on high and mid. And it just basically just came for free. Um, it took a lot of work to get there, but it met all of our goals and the robot will whilst additionally being able to score on the high. I mean, that's just, uh, it's cute because I, these are the, like, there's like, five main trade-offs in this game i think um i think one of them is uh floor versus not floor another one is um tipped cones versus not tipped cones um uh drive base size versus uh stability for center of gravity uh i've lost track of where i was going with mm -hmm. this but um with all these but like you know high or high or not high and you managed to package that in here into a simple robot with how many uh, non-drivetrain motors? Uh, just two. One yeah. on the arm, one on the intake. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the one on the intake then for a second here. Because you've got one intake for three rollers. So what's the? do your best with your fingers to sketch out the belt pattern for me. So like, there's a motor what's... kind of in the, uh, in the back of the intake. It's yeah. running to the bottom roller, which is our cube roller. Yeah. And there's another roller, which is um, the top roller for the cube and the bottom roller for the cone. And there's gears that switch the direction. And then 
there's another top roller that sucks up the cones. So it's just polycarb plates. There's four polycarbonate plates that are all identical. Um, and we're working with first vendors to get those available as a product to buy. So you don't even have to make those parts yourself if you um, don't want to or don't have the resources to do so. So that will be a product that, that teams can purchase. Well, that's very cool. I just like uh, the fact that you did that intake, like, uh, like, cause it's kind of is two intakes. It kind of is two intakes and you did them with uh, one motor is pretty cool. Um, what's the gearing like on the main joint? The arm is a 75 to one, um, through on a Neo okay. through a rev max planetary. And then it, there's just a, there's no reduction in the chain. There is a chain run, but it's one-to-one. -one. Um, going up each side of the structure to the arm pivot. Very cool. That one-to-one -one chain reduction will take absorb a lot of the shock load on that thing. Although it seems like there shouldn't be a huge amount of shock load because of the way the arm is, right? It's really not. The arm, yeah, yeah. The arm will collapse and fold before yeah. it starts to back drive the gearbox. And the, the arm is also so light that like trying to trying to shock load it, it just back drives when it needs to. Um so one of the very exciting things about this robot is uh, the footprint. It is skinny. It is a skinny little robot. It's 22 inches wide. Uh, obviously that's beneficial for balancing the, uh, not balancing, docking and engaging on the charge <laughs> node. I'm trying to get ready for MC season here. Um, what were the challenges that you had associated with building something this small and what challenges will the teams who are trying to duplicate this run into? Yeah, the small drive base, we were certainly worried about it from a tipping standpoint. Um, and we, we were tipping the robot when we were when we were practicing with it originally. Uh, but we found that adding some weight down in the bottom, we added some some big, big weights uh, as ballast, um, almost entirely uh, eliminated that issue. Um, we added a single 25 pound uh, plate weight. Um, and that did a pretty good job. But then once we added the second one, it was nearly impossible for us to tip this robot unless we were very, very much trying to do so. You got 50 pounds so, of ballast in the base. So we, we've got yeah. 50 pounds I, of ballast in the base. Yeah. Can I add to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah 20, 22 I, kilos, folks. But yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I really want to stress this for the teams out there that are thinking about making an every bot. Like, please make sure to put ballast in. Um, it is significantly harder to tip if you do put that ballast and make sure to put it like as low as possible. Like the lower, the better. So Johnny got um, low, low, low. Um, yeah, apple exactly. bottom jeans, boots with the fur. Boots yeah, with sorry. the fur, ballast yeah. on the bottom, you know. Like... Well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to repeat what Ethan said that please put that weight on there. I think it was 72 pounds dry weight, which was no ballast bumpers or battery. And then we stacked 50 on there. So that's that. wild. That's wild. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out in our chat. We got uh, reps from Thrifty Bot. Hey, Ryan, good to see you, buddy. And uh, Andy Mark in there saying, hey, tune into our website soon. We're going to have some plates for you. So very cool Thanks. collaboration that's going on uh, with all of this. So you mentioned the tipping uh, before you added the weight. After you added the weight, um, especially when doing like a high speed turn, any issues with tipping? Um, could you pull up that? But are we able to pull up the video again? Because there's one. We turn sure can. Amazing. <laughs> there's one turn in there. Actually, there's a couple turns that it is a sharp and quick and it barely wobbles. So, um, hold on. Let's see. Jaylene, right. you're a superstar. Jenna, where, what point do you want her to jump to? Um, I think it's around 30 seconds. I should know this. I probably shouldn't edit it. Um, probably spent the last 24 hours editing this thing. I did. <laughs> it's ingrained in my brain. I can tell you exactly what the music sounds like as soon as it does it to you. That's well, that's the arm running into a wall. Yeah. Um, let's see. We'll get there. Okay, it's right here, I think. No, it's not. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> it's okay. Everyone wants to see the video again. And folks in chat, the video is going to be released on YouTube right after yeah. the show. Right there. That that spin, I think, um, is, is pretty quick. I think, I don't know if the video is lagging on the stream, but... Um, there's a couple of different sharp turns. So when, when we post it after the show, you should go watch those. They're very cool. I've, sp I've spent a lot of time driving this robot now and I drive like a madman and I've not been able to tip it once it's got those weights mounted in there. Well, that, yeah. that, that's a we good tried. sign. Um, you know, you always talk about the EveryBot as being competitive, affordable, and efficient. So let's talk about these three things. What makes this year's EveryBot competitive? Yeah, so um, 
I mean, as we discussed, it can score game pieces on every location of the grid. Um, and it has, you know, like we just mentioned, the little baby frame and, and chassis, which allows for those three robots um, to fit on that charge station. I don't know if anyone noticed, but the other two robots were every bots. So kind of kind of a fun little Easter egg. But um, I would say that's what makes it competitive. Um, as far as affordable, we did increase our price a little bit this year just to... Um, we, we talked about it a lot during the off season and we were like, Hey, we would rather spend a little bit extra money and have a robot that is easier for people to design. Well, also inflation is a thing. And inflation exists. So, yeah. um, I think we so all ended up, feel that one in our pocketbooks yeah. for, for sure. I know I do. Um, yeah. but it comes around 1.7 K, um, is, is what the robot is. So at least someone can correct me on that, Ryan or Ethan. But that's correct. I think that's yeah, what seventeen hundred dollars is. That seventeen hundred total, or seventeen hundred on top of what you already get in your kit for free? On top of what comes okay. in the kit. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we mm -hmm. we like I'll add on to what we used to do. We used to go buy the eighty nine cent Home Depot tie plate gussets. It usually required a bunch of cutting to the right shape and stuff like that. This year, we just purchased uh, gussets from Andy Mark and Rev and, and other suppliers. Um, we also um, made use of the brushless motors that came in the kit, which did require buying some motor controllers. But, you know, these are these brushless motors can last for several seasons. And it really is a better investment to, to for teams to purchase those and get involved in the brushless oh. ecosystem. I, I will, I'll, let me add to that. Uh, I think there's like kind of a misnomer out there because before, like with Sims, it's like, you don't use it, reuse a Sim after a season, mm -hmm. like, you know, and, but like brushless, mode, like there were some teams that were replacing their Sims every event. There were some teams that were replacing their Sims mid event, which is uh, wild to think about, <laughs> but um, with a brushless motor, like you can go for years. Like, I, I feel like, I mean, like they haven't been on the market for years yet. So maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that, uh, that's just the way, like there's not stuff that's going to be wearing down inside there. Like you're not burning off windings and such. So that's really big. Uh, what about efficient? What's efficient yes. about this robot? So, I mean, we kind of just talked about the motors, but um, it only has two motors other than that drive train um, and can score everywhere. So kind of short and sweet, um, you know, competitive, affordable and efficient were our goals. And we keep that in mind with pretty much every aspect of, of building this robot and prototyping this robot. Um, and I also see someone in chat who um, wants to hear about the other ideas that we were exploring. And I think that'd be really fun to talk we'll, we'll about. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Don't worry. We got awesome. Hey, for everyone who's posted <laughs> questions in chat, we're, we're not ignoring them. Oh, we got a list. We're going to be coming to them. I, we're, 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 we're getting there, excited. folks. I know. I know. It, you know. Got to chill a little bit here, Jenna. Just got to gotta keep it on an even keel here. <laughs> uh, so strategically, let's say uh, it is week one. It is week one. So, you know, if you're in Ontario, you're at Newmarket or Georgian uh, around the world, you know, you could be competing in Victoria, out in BC, in Israel. They probably start super early like they always do. Uh, where does the EveryBot best fit into a charged up alliance in week one? So fortunately, since it's only got this this one very, very high impact functionality, um, the, the, the strategy is really very simple. You can allow your, your alliance partners to pick up game pieces off of the floor if they're capable. Um, and your first move is to just shoot all the way down to the uh, to the double substation, collect a game piece, run it back and score it. And that's that's what you're doing for the whole match up until time to uh, to go hop on the charge station. Um, we think that in qualifications, you're going to be going for two robots on the charge station most of the time to try to get your rank point. Um, and once you get into eliminations and you get to play with the same teams multiple times in a row, um, then you're going to be going for triple balances or triple three robots engaged, docked on and engaging the <laughs> charge station. <laughs> I need to keep the uh, the terminology right too, because I'll be uh, I'll be drive coaching again this year. But we, we think uh, the strategy um, with it being a simple robot, the strategy is simple too. And this is the most valuable thing that you can do in the game with your time. Uh, okay. You're going to have to run full field cycles for the most part. So we think it's important that you're getting as many points out of those cycles as possible. Okay. So I, I'm a team where I've built the every bot. I compete week one in the regional system. I qualified. I'm going to Worlds. Yay. Sorry, I'm going to the first championship. Yay. I'm excited. I get to go to Houston. I get to have some barbecue. Uh, now I'm at the championship. What should my strategy be here? What's my, how am I going to play on Saturday? You're trying to get your numbers as high as possible. 
Um, this is a cycling game and you're pretty much going to be able, like the top teams are pretty much going to be able to make their, their pick list based on how many game pieces is a robot scoring high. Uh, the robots that can score high are going to score all of their cycles that they possibly can high. Um, every bot we think uh, on, on a field with no other robots on it could probably score eight or nine game pieces high. Uh, with a field with six robots trying to play offense, it'll be scoring maybe in the realm of five game pieces high. Maybe under a little bit of defense, it'll be doing three or four. Um, and we think that those numbers uh, are, are coming, those numbers coming from 2017, the number of cycles you could run are going to be pretty reflective of what we see this year. Um, if you're trying to get picked, you're going to be trying to get your average up into that five range. So I have a theory on cycle time and it's uh, been pretty consistent over the years. It's like the eight, four, two, one rule. And uh, so you say three or four, three or four typically at the championship puts you in two standard deviations above the mean. So like 86 percentile. <laughs> uh, so like, and you're talking top 14%, guess what? That's in divisions of, I think divisions were probably like 75 teams like they have been or whatever. You're playing, yeah. you're playing on Saturday. You're, you're getting picked right no. there. And so there's- no. There's some things, uh, this is like, this is like a high, you know, like there's been ceilings to past every bots and the such. And, you know, if you look at 2019, maybe with, uh, you know, very, very good at the regional level, you know, cause there were some events I went to where it's like, they could have chopped the top half of the rocket off and the game would have been the exact same at that event or whatever, <laughs> but then it seems like, but this one might not expire at championship. This robot is just like a very good cycling robot. Yeah, we think it's going to last much better than uh, previous previous everybots. Uh, you know, we did change our mission statement this year uh, in order to reflect uh, what teams should maybe be focusing more on, um, and that's being a good alliance partner at any level of the game that that you possibly can be. Um, in the past, we said that our goal was to uh, build a robot that teams could build um, and get them picked at champs. Um, sometimes that's not really really a realistic thing. Um, for example, in Rapid Re Rapid React. Um, you pretty much had to have a swerve drive and a traversal climb to be on a pick list at the championship event. Um, we couldn't have done that on an every bot last year. So we're really, we're very, very happy that first added more teams to the championship event, added extra divisions. Um, we think that's gonna make it more accessible for teams. Um, as well as this game, if you focus on the high impact, uh, full field cycle from the shelf up to the top uh, posts and, and top scoring locations for the cubes, then um, you're, you're going to be able to play at the high level, even with a very simple, very affordable robot. I have a tangent. I don't know if I want to go down it because there's so many other things we have to talk about, but it's really interesting how the paradigm has shifted where before, if you wanted to like be like the second robot in the Alliance at championship, it was kind of like, you need to have six wheel drive traction and just be able to be a menace on defense. But then last year, the menace defense bots were the swerve bots. Because back in the day, swerve bots were known for being as like, oh, like they're like, they're little uh, what was the stupid term that that person used to use call them little ballerinas or something like that which is so <laughs> demeaning and offensive in like a lot of other ways or whatever but you wanted the ballerinas on your alliance last year champs because mm -hmm. they were so good at playing defense because swerve defense was like almost overpowered i guess back to everybody i could talk about these things <laughs> whatever uh so this year's robot um could teams just use part of this design could could, could it is it workable to just use the joint system and then put your own intake on it? Or is it workable just to use the intake? You could definitely use just pieces of it. Um, like Ryan mentioned, uh, we are going to have uh, some of the major FRC uh, part suppliers uh, stocking, uh, manufacturing, stocking, and shipping these parts out. So this intake is pretty universal. Um, like, like I've said, the, the arm that we have only has two positions. It's got one to stow inside of the robot and then one that uh, both gets both game pieces off the shelf and scores both game pieces on the high. So if you get this intake presented out at the right height, at the right distance away from your robot, it doesn't matter what kind of linkage or elevator or arm you have, you will be able to use that. Um, we would want to caution teams to not only use two of the pieces of the design of the base, uh, the arm and the intake. Um, if you're going to use two of them, you probably ought to have the third one as well. Um, for example, if you're going to build the, uh, the arm and the intake, remember that the base has those weights on it. So you're going to need that weight for the, for the robot to work properly. We're just playing the video again so people can keep watching it as, as we're talking, as, as it goes on here. Um, so it's one thing to see a robot like this. You know, it's like, oh, wow, that robot looks so cool. That, that, that is awesome. And like, yeah, it seems simple. Uh, two, mo two motors beyond the drivetrain, uh, one axis of freedom kind of deal. But um, uh, can, can this design 
re- realistically be done by a team like we know you all did it in a week but you all are superstars can this be done and by a team like what are the i guess what are going to be the challenges of building this yeah so if you if you made the intake by hand like you could definitely do it the intake plates you could lay out on a sheet of polycarb step drill the bearing holes do that um it's probably gonna be a lot easier to just buy the parts from uh one of the part suppliers like ethan mentioned um and the the other thing is you definitely need to focus on tuning the mechanism specifically getting the the intake rollers to the right height so we we included a way to do that in the design both the hard stop for the extension and the hard stop for the retraction are um, cables that are tied to turnbuckles so let's say you built this robot in your shop let's say your um, portal your shelf is at the wrong height let's say it was an inch too short and you get to the practice field at your first event and you find that out, well, you can do right there on the practice field. You can adjust these turnbuckles to either lengthen or shorten your hard stop cable by whatever is needed to, to get it tuned just right. And then you're, you're ready to go. Last year, there was issues with the, we had a hard stop as well on the over center last year. We didn't document it very well, but it was not tunable at all. You, if you, you set the cable length and that's what it was. You either had to redo it or, um, you were risk breaking your robot. This year, um, we, we definitely took that lesson and, and focused on making it as easy to tune into the precise scoring heights as possible. Uh, just so many questions. This is so, so cool. But um, is there uh, anything about this design that makes you all nervous? You know, because you I'm sure there's a significant amount of pressure. You're releasing a robot that you know is going to be used by 200 or 300 teams. So what's keeping you up at night with this design? Um, yeah, I, I know I already hammered this home, but I'm really going to emphasize that ballast again, because if you don't put it in there, you're going to tip over. And like you mentioned last week and this week, you're going to tip over and you're going to block the whole grid. And then someone's going to try to help you and they're going to block the whole grid. And then it's a traffic jam and the crowd's losing their mind. So um, if not, if you're not driving smoothly and you don't have that ballast, it'll be a problem. So I know that that's a concern of all of ours. Absolutely. That's the big one for me as well. Um, and like Ryan just mentioned, um, tuning in the mechanism to be exactly the right dimensions um, is a little bit difficult. Uh, so like you said, we added the turnbuckles. Um, make sure that you double check that. Um, uh, it's it. We've seen it happen before where an every bot is off by just a very little bit and as it understandably could be because you have to work with the tools that you have. Um, this robot is designed in such a way that you can you can get the holes drilled in the wrong place. You can assemble it together. Um, it'll look bad, but then you'll be able to adjust it back into the right to the right dimension. So double check, make sure you know exactly the height that like go out there with a tape measure, measure exactly the height that you know you need to ro- your roller to be at, and then dial your robot into that exact height. You remember all when you weren't allowed to bring tape measures on the field? Remember that era? Were any of you part of that era? <laughs> when I was a drive coach, I um, had like my shoe calibrated and I had lines on there so I could measure <laughs> stuff with my shoe. And that was my thing, whatever. I had a special pair. Like, it's like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna mark up your good Jordans. I remember that. I was like, okay, I gotta buy a pair of shoes for this. All right, we got a lot of questions in chat. So let's just like hammer them home, give the people what they want. Um, this is uh, a tough one because I'm, I'm not filtering these. I will filter stupidity. I have no patience for stupidity. But this is a, this is a question. This is philosophical. Mm-hmm. Anyone else feel like this every bot is so good it might re- restrict creative design? Any team doing a T2 double substation only that doesn't have a strong design will be adopting this geometry. Uh, this is something that comes up, not just with the every bot, but with COTS in general or whatever, that is COTS hurting creativity. So... For the three of you, you know how much influence this robot has on the first community. Uh, What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, totally valid. And we we do get that a lot. And and for me, at least, I can't speak for the other two. But I think there's a lot of value. As someone who came from a team that wasn't a 118, there's a lot of value in even just building the robot. Even if there's not that like insanely creative aspect to it, like having those instructions and going through those motions and learning that engineering was like extremely, extremely helpful um, to a lot of people. Um, so I, Ethan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, we, we want teams to find success uh, in whatever way fits their team best. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the students, we, we want students to have a positive experience uh, regardless of uh, their circumstances. Um, and this robot, while it is, we think of going to be a very high scoring robot, um, it's also the simplest one that we could design. We couldn't really have designed much simpler. Um, the cone <laughs> and the cube on the double substation is the exact height and very close to the exact orientation that you want in order to place it on the high post. So the high post kind of fell into our lap as this is the easiest way for us to do it. Um, additionally, um, we think that it's valuable to treat robot games as a sport um, and get as much excitement around it as possible. So in, for example, the VEX robotics competition, there is a lot of design convergence. A lot of robots end up building the same thing and maybe by the world championship, a lot of them look the same. Um, we think we'd rather put this design out there early, let teams build it, let teams have success. Um, and now in the no bag era, teams can then iterate and make it better um, and maybe even uh, modify their strategy to work well when they have two everybot partners. So we think um, it, it may be a very good robot. It may restrict a little bit of creativity, but um, if, you're, if you are treating it as a sport and trying to win, um, you can take this and just make yourself better based off of what we've put out. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, uh, first of all, the, the cat is out of the bag on restricting creativity. Uh, you know, like, you know, it started with robot in three days uh, being a thing. And so people saw a lot of designs there. Uh, you know, uh, Rev has put out, uh, I think we're calling it the Rev Rebot, um, <laughs> their design. Uh, RC, the folks at West Coast Products dropped a robot design yesterday. And then you look at the Open Alliance. Like, I mean, if you're a team and you're not looking at what Spectrum is posting every day, what mechanical advantage is posting every day, like you're, there's so much cool stuff in there. And uh, and, you know, you, you talked about the other robotics competition, which I used to, you know, I, I designed it and, and the games and stuff. It was tough because you sometimes you worry. It's a legitimate concern that good ideas don't get developed because other ideas are dropped in front of people. And, and, and that's a thing that may happen. But on the flip side, man, is FRC hard. And that's part of why FRC is so good. It is, it is so good that it's this really big challenge. But that difficulty can also be exclusionary and it can make it harder and it excludes certain types of folks and certain types of teams and certain types of schools. And things like the EveryBot, things like the Open Alliance, open first up to more people. And everyone has their own individual goals about first, but my goal is to get more problem solvers in this world who have the same sort of ethical values that Woody Flowers did. And the EveryBot will help with that. And I, I get the frustration from teams like, oh, well, I guess we just have to copy this to hit a level of competitiveness. But sometimes the floor gets raised and sometimes that's what happens. And that, that's why we're in a competition. So I just think there's uh, a lot of value to this. Uh, it's not for everyone and, and that's okay. And it may change the way that teams play the game, uh, but that's going to happen no matter what, because you know some team out there could drop week three of robot video you know like there's some teams who always like swamp thing always releases this amazing robot super early and everyone's <laughs> like oh no swamp things release what's happening and it's like so you know we'll, we'll see we'll see but it's just uh if it just it's just another offering out there there's so many offerings out there right now uh can you show the robot again we've showed it a few times but we can keep showing it um <laughs> it's like, just like in a week and a half of work yep that's what it was uh I am terrified of all the teams that are going to try and build this and won't be able to make it work and might fall over. Um, Jenna, do you want to restate your warning? Yeah, ballast. Um, but no, to add that, I think one thing we learned from last year was that documentation and good documentation is extremely helpful to people who are first learning to build a robot. And so um, we were really thankful to have uh, to you know, they're now pals, but from first in Michigan, Jack and Jay, who are doing, you know, a ton of documentation. So, so we're also including problems that might go wrong, um, you know, things to look out for. So we're really diving deep to make sure that a lot of these mistakes do not happen. And if we do notice them happening, we're going to start like posting about it and we'll be more active in catching that. And so one good thing that teams can do is join our discord. And if you, see problems or have a problem or don't you know quite know how to build something make sure to post it in there or i'm sure if you search i bet someone else has asked that exact same question so make sure to look out for what resources there are um which i know we'll talk about later as well yeah that's right because uh just in a bit we'll have dan kimura on um if you 
imagine like this is the person creating resources. Like one of the legendary drive coaches at all first, Dan Kamara is going to come on, build some of the coolest robots in first history. Um, uh, how wide is the every bot? 22 inches side to side, correct? Yep. Um, can the bot pick up cones on their sides? It can't pick up anything from the floor, but can it pick up cones on its side from the substation? I think so. Did we test that? We haven't, we haven't tried it. The roller is set at the right height for, a, for an upright cone, so probably not. <laughs> we can but, uh, try. <laughs> te teams, play with it, you know? Like maybe yeah. you can mm -hmm. do something, because like the, the cone has a lot of interesting geometry and different points you can grab on with those rollers and like it compresses to like nothing. So um, with the added weight, is it still under the max weight? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes, definitely. This is wild. <laughs> uh, I would love to hear more about the other design path that prototype that you prototype pretty far down. What other ideas were the Everybot team exploring? So the yeah, other like I mentioned that, that, Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, we had an arm that basically went over the head to score. And that one, um, like I mentioned, required really <laughs> good software. Um, control the arm because it was very finicky on on getting cone. it also got cones from the uh the single substation so it had to have a precise position there had to have precise position for scoring um on the mid um post and um we just we felt that that was too much of a challenge to take on and we actually went through eight or nine intake revs for this this robot mm -hmm. so originally we were trying to get them off the floor and did this robot that really could do everything get them off the floor um, get them from the single substation get them from the shelf score on all the mid and um and all the hybrid nodes and we were kind of chasing that intake for quite a while probably till wednesday um before we finally settled on okay let's let's just get it from the the, the shelf and so that that you know, there was, a, there was a topic earlier, what else could you do? There is a robot architecture out there that is also pretty simple. And if you've got some people that are pretty good at software, could pick up from the floor and score on all these, all these different locations. And even maybe even use the same intake. The intake we used was, was quite similar to the one we ended up putting on the robot. Um, but all the geometry tweaks were um, just, just minor. And we did several revs to make sure that the, the design that we release can be used with as many different um, components as possible. So it, it fits a Rev Ultra Planetary, it fits a Versa Planetary, it fits a 57 Sport, it fits a Max Planetary. Um, it uses belts and pulleys that are available to as many suppliers as possible. So um, we, we did a lot of work trying to do that. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we were doing. Hey, Aaron, do you have any questions for the group? Yeah, for sure. Um, so in the video, was all the scoring done visually or was it programming assisted at all? So it was all done uh, just just by eye. Um, the the scoring location being right in front of your driver's face makes it pretty reasonable to just do that manually. Um, the retroreflective tape will certainly make it a faster cycle. Um, but we think it's important to keep in mind that um, the pickup from the far side of the field may actually be a little bit harder than the scoring side. Um, you have a pretty good sight line, like you're looking straight down the robot to get that lineup done, uh, but uh, ultimately, your intake is only, you know, yay wide, 12 inches wide, and you're trying to line that up with a cone all the way on the other side of the field. Um, just keep Aaron. that in mind, that, that lineup's important too. We're going to get back to the questions from chat, but I want to read some of these comments in chat because I think these are good. My favorite year on my team was when we built the 2019 EveryBot. We had a functional robot before our first event, and we even got to improve on parts of it as a result. It's the only year we've ever had a robot fully ready and the only year we got to play in playoffs and nearly made finals. Uh, from Timmy in GA, which I'm assuming is Georgia. Uh, there is a ton of value in having the underclassmen build in every bot. The instructions are not Ikea style. There are small gaps and you have to refer to CAD and stop and think. We built it for two years and the and did not exact copy. It was a tremendous learning experience. Because teams, remember, you don't have to do all of it. So it's, it's right in there. And then um, uh, Job from 118 says, I laid it on its face last night and it righted itself. Super low CG and helps in all directions. Um, if you could add or change something to the every bot to give it an edge over an average every bot, what would you do? Um, yeah, so I, this is probably a, a cop-out answer, but adding brushless motors to the drivetrain will definitely, you know, increase or decrease your cycle time, get you across the field faster, be more efficient. And and a big thing is, and this isn't as obvious, since the brushless motors don't heat up as much as sims, you can get much more drive practice in at your meetings without worrying about your 
motors overheating. So um, that's that's one thing you could do. You could also add position control on the arm while the Everbot can just, you can just press up and down, running the motor forward and backwards. You could also put position control such that it goes exactly to the position you want for um, the high post and the mid post. Um, along with that, you could add sensors to um, help you balance an auton. We tried doing this with just time statements and with the um, accelerometer on the Rio. We couldn't get it to work on the wood bridge. I, I do think that if you are trying to tune that in an auton, getting some time on a real, um, sorry, not bridge, charge station, getting some time on a real <laughs> charge station on a practice field um, and practice matches would be very, very useful. I think I think the dynamics are gonna be a little bit different from the wood version versus the real version. And then I, the last thing I guess is uh, you could you could add a wrist, you got a floor pickup, you could try to hand off um, from the floor to the intake that's on the Everybot. The geometry looks possible. Definitely if you have a over the frame perimeter floor intake, it, it looks like you could you could figure something out. So that's a, you know, that's a great way to um, increase functionality and give yourself an edge. And, you know, maybe you're the robot picking up the game pieces off the floor right out of autonomous and going and scoring those while your alliance partners are chasing down the field to to get their game pieces. All right, we got a shout out from Dave Powers in here. Thanks to the Everybot team for everything they're doing. Shout out to Dave. Thanks for watching. Uh, Aaron, I see you got a fun question from Swaggy P, Paul Keenan. Yeah, um, I got the question, why is it called Everybud? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there's a, first of all, we were going through the CAD and we were all kind of giggling in a circle when we noticed that it looks like a stick figure when it places a cone like you it looks like a person so I'm going to post that cat on our website but from there on out we were like oh my gosh it's the everybud and we like gave it lore and then it was you know a whole being but um it was probably my favorite part of the design that it looked like that and and, and it's like the everybud because everyone can balance with exactly. it exactly there you go exactly. there you go there you go mm -hmm. uh also glad to see there's no pneumatics uh, that's always a relief i think every uh, person who designs an frc is like oh i can get away with not having to put pneumatics on the robot especially now that you have to have the compressor on board it's like oh just the worst just the worst um one of the every bot will items was play line style defense in front of the opponent's loading zone while fully within its frame perimeter did the every bot team do any testing about this feature in particular do you feel that having an every bot that qualifies for championship will be leaning into that item? This is a good Yeah, question. we def we definitely practiced that one. Um, we got Horizon, our, our the Robonauts 2018 robot down off of a off a crate. Uh, we ran it against there. We were able to play decent defense. Um, this is not a perfect defender robot by any means. Um, it's it is max weight, so it's a little bit heavy. Um, a swerve robot is gonna get around it eventually. You'll be able to slow him down a little. Um, but that was not we don't think that that's the most important thing that this robot is doing. Um, we think at a championship level, a good driver is going to be good enough that they're going to be scoring enough game pieces that they're not really the third robot at a championship event. Um, we think it's much more inspirational to build an offensive robot than a defensive one. So we decided just not to lean too heavily into um, maybe maybe the reality, maybe not, that this could be, could be a game in which you have to have two robots playing offense and one robot playing defense. Yeah, the the you know the uh, the three fingers versus two fingers and a thumb debate uh, that comes up in every game. Every strategist, uh, you know, you argue about it. You will argue about it with your alliance partners at champs. You know, trying to figure out what to do. Uh, there's a lot of open field, so it, it will be hard. Like to me, when I look at this robot, uh, this is not exactly who I'd be picking to play defense. I'd just be like, that's this thing is tall and it's heavy. It's like the uh, I'm just worried. Like you said, I think Swerve Bots will go right around it. at the same time. I think this robot could probably do um, the hip check, you know, like going down the field. It's like, yeah, let me let me throw something out there. But I'd still even be nervous about executing that move with a 22 inch wide robot. I don't know, sure. So it, yeah, for it, sure. it'll, it'll yeah. be interesting to see. Um, how much did the successes and failures of the 2022 every bot influence what you decided to build in 2023? Uh, you know, like we saw you last year before the Everybot played, and I think the Everybot played, and I think there was some, the Everybot didn't have the same level of success it did in 2019, and that it would have had in 2020, but if not for the pandemic. So how did that influence things this year? I think we may have shot too low last year, um, deciding to only do a low goal scoring robot. Lit literally? Um, yeah. Literally, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, as it turned out, well, our goal last year was to build a robot that could get picked at champs. 
Um, as it turned out, like I mentioned, that didn't really uh, materialize with a single championship event versus the dual championship events that we had had in years prior. You had to be a heck of a lot better uh, to get picked at championships last year than you did in, in years prior. Um, the low goal didn't end up being um, a big part of the game by any means. Um, so if we were if if we were building under this uh, this new uh, mission statement that we have, we may have still built the same robot last year, um, just recognizing that we weren't going to be able to build a robot that gets picked to champs. Um, so we're glad that first has uh, has expanded the championship event uh, in the way that they have. Um, additionally, as Ryan mentioned, the linkage last year was a little bit hard to tune in. Um, so we added adjustability to this one such that you can tune it. And our documentation will include that um, showing exactly how to tune in this robot to, to work on the field. Uh, another question, this is uh, diving into some of the details here, very smart question. Is the price that was mentioned the cost if you make the parts yourselves? If yes, any idea what the cost would go up to if you buy items from the suppliers that you were talking about? Yeah, so the, the listed uh, bill materials price is if you buy a polycarbonate sheet and make the part yourself. We won't know, um, we don't know the price yet that the, the various suppliers are gonna sell these parts at, but it shouldn't increase the price by more than $100 or so, um, okay. especially considering you're, you wouldn't be buying this big sheet of polycarbonate um, if you were gonna do that. Um, did you utilize April tags? We did not. Mm -hmm. um, they were on the field in the video, but we we, we did not use them for everybody. So um, you could definitely use them. Um, you know, you could probably add a limelight to this robot to help it score um, somewhat autonomously. Um, just note that the vision tape this year is different than the vision tape in the past. So um, if you got a bunch of vision tape laying around, that's probably not what's on the field this year. Uh, yeah, and like, you know, the new limelight firmware is pretty freaking cool. Uh, yeah. the, the, the localization and the bot pose. Like, Jeez. Looks very powerful. <laughs> Ooh, Brandon outdid himself once again. Uh, could you take this design and plop it on a swerve? Yeah. <laughs> if you if you want to win a championship, yeah, do that. That's what you should be doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Ethan, what chassis dimensions would you go with if you were plopping this on a swerve? I was putting it on a swerve. Uh, probably... <laughs> probably about what it is now okay. i mean the superstructure as it is um works out well you want to have one dimension that's nice and narrow so the 22 yeah. inches that we've got is probably about as narrow as you want to go um, and then you want uh in the direction that you have to drive to score and to pick up you want a little bit longer wheelbase to keep from tipping in that direction um let's talk about resources what resources are available to folks yeah so i mentioned the discord earlier um also our website has you know, the normal stuff, like our build materials, our CAD, our cut list. And the um, URL is? 118everybot.org. It should be in the video at the end too. Um, so if you just Google everybot, you're going to get like a robotic mop. We're fighting that search engine optimization right now. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, side tangent, sometimes people will message us on our website and be like, my mop isn't working, please fix it. And we're like, All right, okay. you know, yeah i am waiting i am waiting for a team just to show up in their pit there's a mop it's like yeah we did the everybody you, you, you said you know like jenna k told us do the everybody mm -hmm. here's our everybody and so we're gonna clean up oh uh -huh. <laughs> oh i'm yeah. such a dad i'm sorry no that was amazing um but yeah sometimes i'll like respond back and it's really funny but anyway so tonight uh specifically we'll have the bill of materials the cat and the cut list on the website um the superstructure guide should be coming out tomorrow um the arm and intake guide will be coming out later this week and then finishing touches and wrap up will be next week so we'll i'll have that timeline listed on the website as well after this i'm going to post the video and i'm going to add the stuff to our website um but beyond that this is a nice segue into the new resources we have. So that's that's right because uh, we'll be talking about all the new everybody resources that uh, the folks at First of Michigan have put, uh, put together in partnership with the Argosy Foundation, and we'll be doing that in just a bit. But before we go here, uh, Aaron, you have final thoughts on this. You know, as the student perspective um, on this robot, I I'm really interested to see how um, other teams that don't choose to go with the everybot are going to navigate trying to defend against this robot because it looks it is very um a really versatile robot and something that can i think is going to be 
really insane on the field if with like put a great driver on, on the controls and and you've got an, a really strong uh team there and i think um yeah i think it's going to be really I interesting to see how games play out with the everybot in them uh ethan ryan jenna any final words or final pieces of advice for teams yeah, I wanted I wanted to acknowledge before uh, before uh, I, my time's up that uh, we had some really really great people come join us this year. Um, mm -hmm. This uh, for for many of the people working on the Everybot this year it was their first time doing it. Um, Ender, Julia, uh, Brandon, Jack, and Jay. Um, they did 98% of the work, and maybe the three yeah. of us did the last two percent. Um, <laughs> yeah. They are they're they're rock stars. They are they're really the heroes here. I have to say, like every time you come up with a super cool mechanism, like last year with the hanger or this year with the joint, like you keep mentioning this person, Ender. I need to meet Ender because it seems <laughs> super, you need to meet Ender. <laughs> super, super, super dope. And, you know, it's a fabulous group that you have. Um, I guess, I, can I ask one last question? So, yeah, like, you've given us the, the Everybot sneak preview. Can we get like a 118 sneak preview? Like, can we just like. <laughs> Right. Ryan's, already, Ryan's already well, dropped some hints. <laughs> looks like we got to go. Yeah, he said some stuff that I'm like, man, you should not be saying. Oh, that. man, Lu Lucian's going to grab you tomorrow, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drop. Uh, thank you to you folks. Thank you to the entire group. Thank you to Team uh, 118 for everything you've been doing. You know, I, I think this year might, you think we'll hit the 1,000th every bot this year, or maybe that'll be a next year thing? Probably next Depends. year. Depends. Probably we, next year, but if it we, happens this close. year, it'll be crazy. We should we, yeah. we should do something. There should be like a ceremony, a celebration, or something like that. It's like you have the thousandth everybody. I mean, but they think about this. We're talking like there's been like 500 or 600 of these across the community. Like it's changed the first community. I think it's also helped encourage the sharing that makes the community so strong. And I don't know. It's just this is stuff like this is what makes this community special. You know, we have this. People say like, why is FIRST special? What is different about FIRST than other extracurriculars? This community and projects like the EveryBot or like the Blue Alliance or like the Open Alliance or like Caleb Sykes scouting databases. Like these are all community things that in other places people don't share like this. You know, like the NFL, they're not sharing their analytical model, their analytics <laughs> models. They're keeping them like super, super guarded and stuff. And as soon as something develops something independently, you know what happens? They get hired and they get bought out. Uh, and by the way, I'm waiting for someone to buy me out, but like maybe it'll happen someday. <laughs> but um, seriously, this is just this is so cool, and it's just amazing that this opportunity is going to be out there. And also, it has disproportionate impact in communities that are harder to reach. And I think that is so so valuable culturally. If you think about the importance of first, and if we're trying to change culture, things like the Everybot are going to reach the folks who need it the most. And so that's so cool. So thank you everyone. This has been fabulous. But folks, don't go away. Stay tuned. We're going to be talking every about more with Dan Kimura, talking about some of the resources that will be available. But we're going to do that after a word from one of our sponsors, Honda. All right, we're a little bit longer on time. Hey, lead producer Sarah, I know you're not producing tonight. I'm sorry, sorry, but hey, we're, 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 we come by eight thirty. We'll do it on by eight thirty. Aaron, how pumped are you right now? I'm so pumped. That was I, seeing the everybot got me so excited, just in general, I, and I'm really excited to talk to Dan here. Yeah, and I'm I, I'm excited to go to. I'm just excited to see so many of these. I just think there's going to be a lot. Uh, there's like a lot of buzz, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, this is really cool. But hey, let's get started with our next segment. We have a first alum, former mentor, and world championship drive coach of Team 469, Las Gorillas, and one of the voices of First in Michigan. Many of you may have seen Dan at the championship, uh, commentating on Einstein. It is Dan Kamura. Welcome, Dan. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Hey, I, it's a blast, man. We go way back, so it's really, it's really great to have you on the show. But um, let's focus on the topic of today. What do you think of the 2023 Everybot? 
That's a that's a good robot, right? I I, I would not be I would not be sad to have that robot with uh, with four six nine bumpers on it. Right, right. And it's like this is the kind of robot you know like Dan you know if you were in you know, this is you know like twenty fourteen you were four sixty nine we're playing this game or whatever this is the type of robot you'd want on your alliance, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. And and I really like that you know it has that offensive aspect to it. Um, you know, I've, I've played matches where you have robots, two robots even playing defense, right? And I've had matches where everybody plays offense. And I think just like when you leave the field afterwards, it feels a little better when everybody was out there scoring. Right, right. You I mean, like if you think of 2010, an example, like the amount of time, just like there's like all these robots just trying to stop you from getting in that tunnel. And it's just like that whole, like everyone working to stop 469. And, you know, like Dan, we dealt with one of the most infamous defense incidents ever in 2007, <laughs> you know? And it's like, this yep. is just... It, there is a better vibe when all the robots are playing offense and you can just go to the other teams like that's wild that you did seven cycles there you know and just yeah yeah and, and as a drive coach right like one of my biggest problems one of the biggest issues i had as a drive coach was like showing up to our pre-match you know uh strategy yeah. session and saying i really want you to play defense and they're like oh but we built this robot we think we can finally score and i you know a lot of times i'd be like look try to score Let's try yeah, it because because yeah. I want them to have the experience of using their robot. And so the more that they show up with a robot that is capable, that can play the game, that can score uh, and join you on offense, the easier it is for you to say, hey, look, if you want to play defense, we can we can make a strategy for that. If you want to score, let's all score. And, and I guess that speaks to the versatility of this robot, which mm-hmm. is uh, really, really cool. So uh, explain to me what First of Michigan is up to this year in regards to the every box. I don't think the audience is very aware, but I think it is super, super cool. But like, start from the beginning. Like, what was the source of inspiration of this idea? Right. Well, I mean, I think the fact that people aren't aware yet, we're trying to change that. I think we have a history at First of Michigan of making some great stuff and then not telling anybody about it. So um, we're trying to we're trying to change that with this. But I mean, and, and you kind of stole my thunder. You've already touched on a lot of the points I was going to touch on. But, you know, it's about access, right? Um, we want in Michigan, we want every school to have an FRC team. And there are reasons why that's difficult. And there are reasons why there, there are big challenges with that. And, and our outlook has always been, okay, so let's solve those challenges. And one of the biggest challenge is, I mean, Gail does, has done a great job on the financial side. I know, you know, paying for your competitions and your parts is a big thing. We've made a lot of progress there, but mentors is the other big thing, right? So we have uh, a lot of teams that won't start because we can't get a teacher. We'll have we'll have buy-in from the school district, from the principal, from the students, and they just can't find somebody to run the team. Um, and sustaining teams, right? Giving them a successful season so that they can build on, on that success, find more mentors, and actually have time to build the team are some of the major issues that we're seeing. And, and as you were saying, a lot of the schools that maybe need this program the most or the, where this program can do the most good are the schools that are suffering the most from this. And um, with my other job at the Robot Garage, uh, we have done some like science and, and educational, like robotics education stuff um, where we do video lessons. And the teacher is not the mentor. The teacher is not the teacher. The teacher becomes a facilitator. And, you know, I'm on camera. I'm trying to explain the concepts, show them how to build and program the robot. And that's that's been pretty successful where we tried it. And just discussing that with Gail and, and thinking about the EveryBot, we were like, hey, you know what? Like we can put those pieces together and we can do the same thing for first teams. That is uh, super, super cool. So you've assembled, you're basically, you know, like trying to make this process easier and trying to kind of provide like, you know, almost like virtual mentors in a way. So teams have access to do these things. Right, exactly. I mean, so so the video aspect, right? And, and I have not said this, but our goal is to do a complete video guide for building the entire every bot. So from the chassis through programming, uh, we're looking at potential ways to even get uh, some of the competition experience underway. So like, you know, uh, there are some early events that that uh, some of these uh, robot in three days are going to, and may- maybe we can show up to one of those and do some filming there to be like, hey, we're going to go out for a match. This is how you check the robot. This is how you get prepared. So we want to do the whole package uh, if we can. Obviously, we got some time issues, constraint yeah. issues. So we'll see. We'll see how far we get. But um, I mean, that's our goal. And video, I think, is a natural fit for that for a few reasons. I mean, the first thing is these days, if you want to learn how to change a tire, jumpstart a car, fix your plumbing, whatever, right? You're going to YouTube and you're searching for a how-to video. Yeah. So so we're getting on board with that. Um, and I think written instructions can be very powerful. And a lot of times I'll look for written instructions as somebody who kind of has a good technical like basis, right? But I think for people that don't have that underlying knowledge, written instructions can be very daunting as well, right? So we're trying to make it so that you can see the process 
And you're not sitting there thinking, okay, did I do this step right? Can I move on to the next step? You can look, you can see mine looks exactly the same as yours. We're ready to go. Um, and our videos are going to be long. I think uh, you, you mentioned it was a very thorough video. Our first video just on the chassis build was over two hours long. But we are trying to be diligent at putting chapters in. So if there's a section you know, skip to the next chapter, right? You don't want to yep. watch me make all the wheels, skip to the next chapter. But for some people, I think that's that's beneficial to have. Yeah, I think there's there's huge value in that. I think it's also like a generational thing. Like Aaron, do you find that you use, when you have a problem, do you use Google more or do you use YouTube more? I find like if I'm trying to physically like make something or, or, or fix something, then definitely like seeing it in a video helps me visualize the problem a lot more. So it's, I, it's really great that you are putting that forward and rather than, you know, it, kind of catering to different learning styles in this way. Yeah, I think that's very, it's very bang on because there's different people are going to process things a different way. And we want to talk about access. It's about reaching as many mm -hmm. people as we can. So let's take a look at a short clip of that chassis video that you mentioned, Dan, uh, put together by yourself in the virtual robotics studio. Daniel here, back again with the Virtual Robotics Studio. And guess what? It is time. We have gotten the dimensions from the EveryBot team out of Texas, the Robonauts. So we are going to start our chassis assembly. And in order to do that, you are going to need your AM14U5 box. This has all of the kit apart chassis components that we're going to need. And the only other parts we need for this build are the sim motors. So Let's get going. The first step is on the main output shaft here where it comes out of our transmission. We're going to take our middle wheel. Remember the middle wheels have pulleys on both sides. And we're looking for the one with the metal insert. Take that metal insert, that metal hub, and that goes facing in towards the motors and just slide that all the way on until it's touching. All right, next on this, we're going to take two of those timing belts and we need to get one of them on that back pulley. So I'm going to kind of work my way around the wheel here, fish it around the wheel and get it onto that back pulley. And it needs to go under this top churro. Okay, so when it's pulled tight, you can see it's gonna not hit that churro, it's gonna go right around them. Yeah. So this is gonna go on and we're gonna slide this on kind of like this. And you can see this giant hole on the bottom, that is where this bearing is gonna go and where we're gonna pick up support of this shaft. Other than that, we have finished our chassis. So awesome job with that, and we'll be back with you in the next video. All right, that's pretty cool. That's, uh, I, I watched, like, I wouldn't say I watched the whole two hours, but I watched like a good chunk of it on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is every little thing. Like, just like there we saw, it's like, yeah. And the belt goes under this churro. It would be so easy to just miss that. You know, if you're reading through, instructions is like you know like sometimes you read through instructions like oh i wish there was a picture or i wish there was something and so that is fabulous aaron how do you feel with that is like do you feel like that's like at the right processing right for people absolutely yeah. yeah it's it's way it's personally just for me um it's way easier for me to watch a video and be able to tell that i'm at the right space than like you were saying before um uh, doing a step in a written instruction and then trying to go, oh, did I do that right? Or <laughs> have I screwed something up? And it, it's just, I like you were saying before about access, I, I think that's a really great step to take. Yeah, we're, we're trying to sort of take the fear out of robot building. And, you know, in, in Michigan, we have a couple of other workshops that we're doing. We actually do a workshop with teachers who are considering starting a team. Then we do a workshop with everybody that is a rookie team um, and then kind of feeding into this. And it's just like, look, you can do this, right? You need, you need some help, you need some guidance, but you can build a robot. Um, and just creating those tools, I think is very important. Yeah, and you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's lowering the barrier of entry into first. It's uh, mm -hmm. making, the hardest fun you'll ever have a little bit easier, but still hard enough that it's still like yep. the, the challenge is there. And like first has no issues with being too easy. Like that's just not a thing. <laughs> that's just not a, not a reasonable uh, sort of pathway, but this guidance is like, yeah, I can do this. Like, you know, a, a student watching this be like, oh yeah, I can help with this. I can make this happen. A teacher who's never thought of having a robotics team be like, okay, there's, there's enough guides. There's tutorials. Myself and my students can figure this out. And sometimes mentors are intimidated, mentors from industry, because you walk in and it's like, oh, 
everyone's been doing this for like 10 years. They're all these alum and, alumni and stuff. It's like me as a person, like, yeah, maybe I have a background in engineering or a background in machine, but I don't know if I have the expertise, but it's like, yeah, like you can do this. So this is really cool. Dan, you said First in Michigan does all this cool stuff, but you don't necessarily, uh, the whole world doesn't know about it. <laughs> Where can teams find these resources? Uh, definitely check out the First in Michigan website. So all the videos will be embedded uh, on firstinmichigan.org. Uh, we have a whole page for the Virtual Robotics Studio. Uh, there are notes there. We'll also have any files that you might want to access. So we have the, uh, of course, links to the official build guide, the, the written build guide in there. And we're going to try to break out any diagrams you need, parts lists and stuff like that, cut lists, uh, just so you can access all of the, you know, what you might want in written form uh, to go along with the video. Uh, and then we do have our YouTube channel. So the First in Michigan YouTube channel is going to have everything there as well. And Dan, uh, so the, the chassis build videos, there's a strategy video that's already up. How, you know, I hate to throw people up on this, put people on the spot, but how long do you think before uh, everybody uh, superstructure videos would be ready? Uh, we have been uh, rushing to get parts in-house uh, so that we can build the stuff. Um, I stopped filming to jump on this call. So we, <laughs> we, we hope to have a video out tomorrow uh, with wow. kind of the first superstructure build. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a bit of a rush. We're learning a lot as we do this. This is the first time we've kind of put something like this, this together. Um, and I mean, like the chassis build, uh, we're building two robots. So you won't see this, but behind the scenes, we are building a robot then we're coming back out with a fresh set of parts and we're building it again for the camera. So we can hopefully catch some of those snags, make notes of things we want to point out as we go yeah. through it. Um, but I would say that building the robot behind the camera is, is probably four times less time intensive. It's about four times more time doing it on camera. Yeah. And that's not in counting, you know, not counting the extra prep work. So uh, a video that you see that's two, two hours and 20 minutes long, we were probably in front of the camera for, for over eight hours. Yeah. It's, that's amazing. Uh, Dan, anyone you want to thank for that's been helping you along with these uh, resources? Oh, yeah. Uh, too many, too many people. I obviously thanks to the whole Everybot team, right? Um, yeah. Bringing that robot out uh, has just been such a beneficial resource. And we're just trying to trying to see what we can do with that. Uh, extra special thanks to Jack and Jay. Again, we sent both of them down to Texas and they were both kind of relaying information, keeping us involved, helping us plan ahead so that we could hit the ground running as fast as possible on these videos. Um, we are actually hosted, our studio is at uh, the high school, uh, Lake Orion High School. So that's team 302. They've been hosting us here. They built all of the furniture that's behind me, helped us put the signs up. So they've been extremely supportive behind the scenes. Um, and obviously the Argosy Foundation, right? Without them, none of this is possible. Yeah, the Argosy Foundation um, has helped with this project and just done so much for First Canada and oh, First yeah. in general, just a, a huge support from John Abley, Emily Van Dunk and all the amazing people there. So thank you uh, okay. for all of that. Uh, Dan, before you go, um, any thoughts on this year's game? Anything you want to share to the audience? Any nuggets of wisdom? <laughs> um, wow. Uh, it, it's interesting because, like, of course, you know, I see the game. I start thinking about stuff like that. Yeah. And then I have to turn that off and focus on, like, we got to build this robot for the videos. Um, I think, you know, floor pickup, don't, don't get too enamored with floor pickup. If you are a team that knows you can do floor pickup, do floor pickup. A few people are going to have to. Those extra few points in auto mode might pay off. Um, that's like, if you think the grid is going to get full though, right? It's one yeah. point for putting it up in auto mode versus, versus not. So if the grid's not going to be full, um, you know, I, I don't even know how impactful that's going to be. Obviously I expect the best of the best to be scoring another one, two, maybe three pieces in auto mode. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what to do, I think that everybody really hit on the strategy that, that I would recommend to most teams, which is, you know, if you can drive and pick up from the, the human player, I don't, whatever it's called. I'll, I'll learn the names, I promise. Um, but if you can drive and grab that, right? Um, and it takes you two extra seconds to drive over there, but you're fiddling around trying to like write a cone or get to the right side of the cone before you pick it up, that's going to cost you more than two seconds. Yeah. It's got to be, I, I mean, with cycle cycles, everyone always thinks that, oh, the determining factor for cycles is the, the driving time. And it's yep. never the driving time. It is not the driving time. It is intake time and release time. Yep. So one thing yep. I love about the everybody, slam in. Mm -hmm. come back you know like the amount of automation you can do there and the amount of automation you can do with the release and like if you do an every bot you do something like this you have more time to work on automation you have more time to work on these things anyways yeah can... no for sure and i and this gripper is this gripper is the real deal like i have seen some grippers from other teams uh yeah. I, I watched a lot of the robot in three days grippers yeah i don't think right now i've seen anything better than this so if you're still working on your gripper design you definitely want to check this out it is 
for sure. And that's like, you know, the, I always say the number one thing in a game is that you got to figure out drivetrain. And the number two thing you got to figure out is uh, acquisition and release of game pieces. And it mm-hmm. seems like they really nailed this one. So Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, love the resources you've all been creating. Thanks to everyone at First of Michigan. Also, we had one comment in the chat. Maybe explain who Gail is. Gail Alpert, the president of First of Michigan, who's uh, contributed to so much of the growth in Michigan. And, uh, you know, it's been a driving influence at first. You all were the first ones to go to districts, which has been a, a great change. I know for up here in Ontario, we love our districts. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks first to Michigan for being a part of this and can't wait to see the full resources. It was going to be fabulous. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Dan. Aaron, this was like a wild show, right? Yeah. This is uh, so much happening here. Um, I, I'm just pumped. I am pumped. Well, you have any final thoughts on everybody, Aaron? Just, it, again, I'm so excited for this season and just coming back and seeing the everybody and just seeing people getting excited about this, yeah. this season. It's, it's so exciting to me. Um, and it just makes me really happy that there's so many people out there that are so um, just passionate about the, the same things that I am and my team is. And it, it's really great to see how, how much good there is in, in this first community. I, I, the community aspect, like, don't get me wrong. I, I geek out over a robot and I love like the intricacies of the design and all that oh, stuff. Yeah. But I just like the, seeing community come together, seeing people from all over the globe, like just watching chat tonight, uh, everyone being really into it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to bed happy thinking about uh, everyone. I'm going to be thinking also about the Dallas Cowboys, how they beat the Tampa Bay uh, Buccaneers <laughs> last night. That was freaking awesome. See ya, Tom Brady. But I'm going to be thinking <laughs> about, about this community that we're all a part of and what a pleasure and joy it is to be a part of it. Uh, Absolutely. For next, not next week, in two weeks' time, we'll be back here on First Canada Live. We are going to have uh, a recap of the First Lego League Challenge Provincials, which just happened this past weekend. We're going to have one of the top teams come on, chat with us, and we'll talk a little bit about the First Lego League Challenge experience. And also, Aaron, the Youth Council is coming back in a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about um, a really important topic mental health as you deal with uh, your college university applications and graduation. Uh, You know, life is pretty not super static but like you have like a routine when you're a young person and you're in school it's like yeah go go to school but then you finish high school and as you're finishing high school it's like everything's going to change and how do you deal with that pressure that can be a lot that can i mean it wore on me when i was finishing high school to the point where it probably wasn't healthy and so the youth council is going to be talking about different strategies to deal with your mental health as you deal with applications, graduation, and everyone asks you, so what are you doing next year? So what are you doing next year? You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did technically did not ask you on the show at all, man. I know you hear it all the time. I'd much rather ask you about your headphones, see what's going on there. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so two weeks time, January 31st, that's going to be a good show. Uh, reminder, if you want to keep up to date with what First Canada is doing, uh, subscribe to and turn on, subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications. You'll know when we're going to go live. Everyone out there, stay safe, uh, get boosted, mask up, and we will see everyone soon. Thanks for joining us, everyone, all across the world. It's been a good one. Bye, folks.